Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, I actually grew up in Louisiana, so it brought back great memories on the drive from Pensacola uh, to uh, LA. So we'll be talking about the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. Rod assured me this was very informal, so feel free to ask questions. Uh, I have um, some institutional support from Genentech. So triple negative breast cancer, it's a very distinct entity within breast cancer. But what we're learning as we're genomically profiling these tumors is that there's a lot of heterogeneity within the disease. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the role of carboplatin and adding it to standard chemotherapy. The fact that we're using capecitabine more in a subset of women. And just so that all of the non-medical oncologists don't fall asleep, we will talk about some non-novel targets that are promising. And I think that's becoming more and more relevant as we saw the FDA agnostic biomarker approval for immunotherapy, that all of our, these cancers are promiscuous and we should learn other disease pathways because we'll never know when we apply it. And as you guys know better with the GYNOC, you beat us with the PARP inhibition. Um, so triple negative breast cancer, just to remind any medical students, uh, estrogen and progesterone are not overexpressed with this type of breast cancer and the HER2 oncogene is also not overexpressed. We used to lump triple negative breast cancer as one entity, and while it shares those common biomarkers, or the lack of those three biomarkers, what we're learning is that it is a very heterogeneous disease, and it comprises about 15% of all breast cancers. There's a higher proportion in African American women, and we see a younger age of onset than we do with other subtypes of breast cancer. And I know we'll talk a lot about genetic testing later today, but interestingly, compared with non-triple negative breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer does have a higher rate of germline mutations being associated with it. Additionally, there are a lot more somatic mutations associated with it. However, we're only finding a few that are actionable in 2018. And I think that we all agree that in this disease, genetic testing and access to care are very important. Um, and then the recurrence pattern is different. While estrogen receptor positive breast cancer generally almost always recurs in the bone, uh, in addition to other sites, triple negative breast cancer uh, very often goes to the visceral uh, sites as well as the CNS. Uh, leptomeningeal disease is uh, more common with this subtype of breast cancer. And the median survival is shorter than other subtypes of metastatic breast cancer even in 2018. Uh, we're hopeful that the drug discovery over the last 18 months will change that. However, uh, it is one that we wanna get it right the first time that someone has it with uh, either preoperative or adjuvant chemotherapy. So I alluded to this. This is, uh, you know, the, uh, triple negative breast cancer is heterogeneous and they have multiple clinical subtypes. Basal, <laughs> immunomodulatory, which probably uh, applies across all subtypes of breast cancer. Some are driven by the androgen receptor or the luminal type of triple negative breast cancer, some mesenchymal stem cells, and some we don't exactly know what drives that type of triple negative breast cancer. And uh, you may have also heard about other types of genomically profiling tools such as PAM50, and we're trying as a breast cancer community how to figure out how to incorporate that into what we do every day in taking care of our patients. So I think that one myth that comes out there is that chemo, this is a chemorefractory disease. And really, it's the opposite. Chemotherapy is the cornerstone of therapy in this disease in 2018. And yes, we do have a subset of women or men that do not respond to chemotherapy in this disease, but the vast majority do. So uh, giving the right chemotherapy, maintaining the schedule, et cetera, are very important. And again, we'll talk about possible signals that some populations may benefit from certain agents, but really they're not quite ready for prime time yet. So neo or adjuvant therapy for uh, medical students and residents out there, just to remind us, the goals of that therapy are for curative of intent, and, it's to, uh, and sometimes we give neoadjuvant therapy to avoid under or over treatment. And, what, and we'll talk about what chemotherapy uh, regimens are optimal. Should we incorporate carboplatin? 
And if we don't get a great response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, should we give more treatment? And then, you know, I always like to say that I uh, was born in the village in India, and uh, sometimes the basic lessons my grandmother taught me are really important. Uh, which, um, and I'm not talking too much about that today, but lifestyle interventions are so important. While I use the washing machine um, and take a, a, a supplement of vitamin D, she was hanging her own washing out back and getting her own natural vitamin D and trying to maintain her own bone density. So, uh, but I think that bisphosphonates are something that we're underusing in uh, triple negative breast cancer and something to think about in this uh, disease that's highest risk. And also to talk with our patients, no matter how awkward it is, about lifestyle management. Because again, I'm not going to go into it today, but we do know that women that exercise over two to three hours a week do have a lower risk of uh, breast cancer. And um, you know, eating the way that our grandparents ate off the farm and um, small quantities and a well-balanced diet. Those are all things that I think that we should still incorporate in the era of sexy targeted therapies. And it's important to make that extra five minutes. And I'm guilty of not always doing it with our patients to remind them that those, there are some things that they can do to empower themselves with this disease. So um, regarding the optimal type of chemotherapy, there was a huge debate in breast cancer about a decade ago, can we omit the cornerstone of progress, anthracyclines. Well, we finally got our answer through the ABC trial, which randomized women to taxane-based therapy compared with taxane and anthracycline comparing therapy. And just so we don't have an alphabet soup, the bottom line was that in high-risk patients, i.e. Um, triple negative breast cancer, it is still very important to incorporate anthracyclines uh, in, in our therapy of that disease, especially if they don't have any comorbidities. And um, as you can see, there was an 11% uh, benefit in, in incorporating um, anthracyclines in the node positive setting, and a more modest benefit. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard John Marshall, um, who's a prominent GI oncologist, uh, speak, but he jokes that in breast cancer, 1% uh, always moves the needle, as opposed to any other disease. Uh, and that uh, it's because of the empowerment of the women and the pink ribbon uh, advocacy that uh, we have a lower threshold for a drug, uh, calling a drug efficacious. But I do think that in triple negative breast cancer, where we do have one chance to try and re prevent recurrence, it is important to incorporate anthracyclines if there are no comorbidities. So um, the ASCO guidelines, which are in, uh, being updated, we did recommend that, um, that anthracyclines and taxane should both be used. So <clears throat> a lot of you that do genetic counseling know that we send a patient to you while they're undergoing neoadjuvant therapy and breast cancer. What are the rationale uh, for uh, women undergoing neoadjuvant therapy? You know, a lot of times women do present with locally advanced breast cancer, and we need to downsize the lesion. So it's to um, render the um, locally advanced breast cancer operable. To stop ineffective therapy, so, because if we give adjuvant therapy, we don't know if their tumor is responsive or not. And um, sometimes we do have progression during neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and we, send, we call our uh, friendly surgeon and say, please, please uh, you know, do the mastectomy. Uh, and some women do not want a mastectomy, so it's to downgrade. Provide prognostic info. And we'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute. And then the FDA has been using it to expedite drug approval, and then also t so that we can learn more about tissue biomarker changes. And I know we'll have a debate a little bit later about uh, ovarian cancer pre-op versus adjuvant. So uh, I think some of the same principles apply. And then also, theoretically, we want to improve patient outcomes and avoid undertreatment and overtreatment in this disease. And people say, well, is my risk of recurrence lower or higher, if, depending on how we sequence the chemo? There was a large meta-analysis published which showed that there was no difference in the rate of distant disease recurrence and no difference in overall survival. However, there was a small increased risk of local regional recurrence. I caution people to interpret these data, which made the New York Times and Washington Post a little bit um, 
cautiously, because remember that these trials were performed uh, pre-targeted uh, therapy with trastuzumab. They lumped all types of breast cancer together. So I'm not sure that this really applies. Uh, and additionally, um, I know we'll have a talk about breast surgery, but I would say that breast surgery has evolved quite a bit, and radiation has evolved quite a bit since the uh, meta-analysis, um, the, the participants in that meta-analysis. So in breast cancer, we have a debate about what is the role of neoadjuvant therapy, and does someone having a pathologic complete response, meaning eradication of all of their known disease in the breast and axilla, impact prognosis? The um, FDA did a very elegant uh, meta-analysis several years ago where they pooled uh, uh, 12 randomized control trials across the world of 12,000 patients. And what they found was that those women that achieved a pathologic complete response had superior event-free survival and overall survival compared with those that did not achieve a pathologic complete response. And this pertained especially to the triple negative subgroup. So we discussed that anthracycline and taxane containing therapy are the backbone of therapy for triple negative breast cancer. What about the role of uh, carboplatin and why are we so, um, why are we still studying uh, platinum salts uh, 40 plus years after they came into the market? Well, now we're finding out that DNA repair is very important in triple negative breast cancer. And it's important to remember that platinum have activity in BRCA-associated breast cancer. And we found through numerous studies that we'll go over that they increase pathologic complete response. However, with any good thing, it always increases toxicity, whether it's the bone marrow fatigue or neuropathy. And for those women that want to seek fertility after breast cancer, it does increase the risk of amenorrhea as well. So the Germans did a trial, and I promise I won't uh, go into every single detail, but the Germans did a trial where they added carboplatin to what they considered the backbone in Europe in this trial. And what they found was that in the triple negative breast cancer, when carboplatin was incorporated, there was a higher pathologic complete response rate. And there was also a higher disease-free survival in those women that underwent carboplatin versus those that did not. However, um, one major criticism of this trial is that they did not use an uh, alkylating agent like cyclophosphamide, which is the standard of care in North America. Uh, so is it because we're using the carboplatin and the cyclophosphamide wasn't universally adopted? That's what we don't know. Then the Americans um, community did the CalGB trial where they also looked at the addition of both paclitaxel and bevacizumab to standard chemotherapy. And what they found was that bevacizumab did not add anything to breast cancer. And as opposed to ovarian cancer, by the way, in breast cancer, we do not use bevacizumab um, anymore. Um, the FDA um, accelerated approval has been since revoked. Um, so what we found were, on this trial was those patients that achieved a pathologic complete response had better survival. And that goes along with the FDA meta-analysis. However, when they looked to say, did the carboplatin make a difference or not in this trial, it did not. So uh, that was, um, you know, we're not, we're not exactly sure why, except that in breast cancer, anytime we don't find a difference, we always say it was underpowered. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, especially because the bevacizumab was incorporated too, and in 2018, that's not really a relevant drug for breast cancer. <coughs> Another trial, <coughs> Brightness, um, that was just published, also looked at carboplatin, but it also included a PARP inhibitor, uh, viliparib, uh, and, <clears throat> and um, what this trial showed is that carboplatin increased the pathologic complete response. These two arms contained uh, carboplatin uh, compared with the standard therapy. However, adding the PARP inhibitor did not produce any benefit. And we also looked to say, because there were some metastatic data that suggested that women who had BRCA1-2 mutations 
ha derive more benefit from carboplatin than non BRCA mutation carriers. They did analyze that in all three of these trials, and it has been a mixed bag. And again, uh, you know, it might be because of they were not designed to look just in BRCA carriers and it's underpowered. But I think that many breast oncologists do have a very low threshold in a BRCA positive tumor to incorporate carboplatin because of the signals from the metastatic setting and the confounded uh, trials that show signals as well in the um, neoadjuvant setting. So in summary, when should carboplatin be considered? It's very individualized. I think that when you need rapid control of local disease, such as inflammatory breast cancer, uh, it's very reasonable. For those that are highest risk of relapse, again, stage three or very young, and then benefit to mutation carriers, it's still under investigation, but I personally do consider a platinum salt in this situation. And it is not yet incorporated in the NCCN or ASCO guidelines uh, because we're still investigating it in um, standard adjuvant trials. So it, that's why it's a mixed bag of what we should do. So um, this is just a slide to remind us that you've given your neoadjuvant therapy and your patient did not achieve a pathologic complete response. It's most important if you look at the <laughs> subtypes of breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer. So um, the Japanese performed a trial called the CREATE-X trial. And it is very, uh, it, it took, a, uh, I would say, a couple of years for the breast cancer community to embrace these data because they're very different than data that we've observed. And what they looked at is, is that women who received standard adjuvant, I mean, new adjuvant therapy with an anthracycline and a taxane, let's go ahead and if they had residual disease, give them capecitabine versus uh, no therapy. And what they found was that there was an improved overall survival benefit with very short-term follow-up in those women that received capecitabine. And we're still trying to reconcile that data, but I think that if we don't have a clinical trial to put these patients on, um, many of us are using standard uh, capecitabine. Uh, it's, it, you know, just as a pragmatic thing for all the awesome nurses, because you guys are the, uh, I would say, the police with uh, all of our drugs that we administer, are that the capecitabine that is approved is a much higher dose than we generally use in North America. And also, um, the capecitabine doses used in this trial are associated with significantly um, higher toxicity than in the Asian population. And so the hand foot syndrome, the diarrhea, or um, um, they're, um, especially in the older patients too, it's um, not well tolerated at the high doses. So you've got to remind us uh, doctors that go from room to room, hey, is this really the dose you want of the cape? Uh, because our EMRs are programmed, you know, in some different ways, so. Because you guys are really the gatekeepers, so. Huh? Oh, yeah, so. Uh, and then bisphosphonates, uh, you know, just, I just uh, want to touch on that very briefly. Um, there was our early breast cancer trialist group meta-analysis that looked at 18,000 women over 26 trials, and what they found is, irrespective of <coughs> ER status, in postmenopausal women, there was an improvement in overall survival, as well as a decreased recurrence. But the key is postmenopausal women, and I think it's important at least to have a discussion in our postmenopausal women with triple negative breast cancer because this is an easy enough um, drug to administer for, for them, and oral or IV. So I'm going to shift gears to metastatic breast cancer and remind us of the goals of therapy. Obviously, to control cancer while we maintain the quality of life. And the modality of therapy, again, in triple negative breast cancer has always been chemotherapy. And the choice is based on toxicity, previous drug exposure. Other things that we're gonna talk about today are androgen receptors, immunotherapy, and PARP inhibitors. So regarding what type of chemo, uh, my old mentor used to say there are more chemotherapy agents than French wines and cheeses. And uh, you know, so we have um, several drugs that we can use, and really it depends um, when we make a choice is what toxicities, underlying toxicities, do the um, uh, women or men have, and also what drug have they had most recently, what was their disease-free interval, 
And so, you know, the taxanes, the platinum salts, aribulin, capecitabine, doxorubicin, venerelbine, ixabipalone, and gemcitabine, those are all potential choices. And then uh, we are going to talk about newer therapies of PARP inhibition, immunotherapy, and the triple negative breast cancer um, targeting um, sas sasituzumab. So this is just to remind us why we need new drugs in metastatic breast cancer. If you look here, even in first-line therapy, the response rates, uh, well, this is first-line, but even in over after second, third, fourth line, the response rates are despondent. You know, they're very, very low. And so um, that's why there's a real need. So um, the androgen receptor has uh, brought up a lot of, uh, or has had a lot of attention over the last several years. And interestingly, the androgen receptor is ex overexpressed both in ER positive breast cancer as well as ER negative breast cancer. And there is a subtype of breast cancer within the triple negative. It's a small group that behave like estrogen receptor breast cancer. Um, and so that's why we're targeting this androgen receptor is for that group of um, uh, women so far. And uh, there are several drugs to target androgen in breast cancer. The furthest along is enzalutamide. Uh, the bicalumutamide was uh, studied, but um, the enzalutamide is thought to be more potent. And then um, they're also looking, just like we have um, tamoxifen, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, they're also looking at selective androgen receptor modulators in this uh, um, disease. And so enzalutamide, again, it is a potent androgen receptor antagonist. It binds directly to the androgen receptor, has um, significant preclinical activity, and this is the largest phase two trial that was um, actually just recently published by Rod and I's um, leadership development program friend, um, uh, uh, Dr. Trena. And what it showed is, is about 35% of patients actually derived clinical benefit uh, with uh, androgen receptor. And <clears throat> there was a progression-free survival of 12.6 uh, weeks in unselected patients, but with those that had a special assay, that showed a higher expression of androgen receptor, the uh, progression-free survival was uh, far better. And it was very well tolerated um, in general. I would say fatigue was the most um, prominent side effect. And then, uh, again, this is just to say that um, I think that um, we, we need better assays to figure out what is the right concentration of androgen receptor positivity we need um, before we can bring this to prime time, and we haven't yet had any phase three data, but it's something that we're definitely looking at more in our triple negative breast cancer is to rule out the androgen receptor expression, um, in, especially in patients that recur three, four, five years out, not the ones that recurred six to eight, 12 months after adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, those women are probably not going to be androgen receptor positive. Um, and so I'm going to shift gears to immunotherapy, but you guys are going to have a far more elegant uh, talk about uh, immunotherapy. And uh, just to remind us that um, immunotherapy, it's a normal part of immune regulation. And we have antibodies that block the PD-1 pathway. And what this does, it reactivates T cell activity and proliferation and enhanced anti-tumor activity. So, uh, immunotherapy for triple negative breast cancer is lagging behind other tumors such as lung cancer and bladder cancer, which especially lung cancer has routinely incorporated immunotherapy. And so there are two drugs that are furthest along in breast cancer. One is pembrolizumab and one is atezolizumab. And um, pembrolizumab, it was first reported in San Antonio of 2014 and we still haven't had a drug approval. So uh, again, I think that um, it speaks to the fact, and Dr. Riccone is going to talk a little bit about it, is are we finding the right target to, uh, of women to use these drugs in? Uh, because you know we're beyond the point of lumping all triple negative breast cancer into one. And um, these, I, I suspect that atezolizumab will have some data at ASCO this year, and will probably be FDA approved within the next year for breast cancer. Uh, because of promising activity reported, 
a couple of years ago where they used it with NAB paclitaxel. And I showed you the dismal um, response rates of women past uh, second line, I mean past first line. And as you can see here, it's pretty promising that at least a quarter of patients who are second, third line seem to respond to immunotherapy. It's still not a home run, but it's better than before. And then I feel a little bit um, embarrassed talking about PARP inhibitors to this crowd, but uh, there are two PARP inhibitors that we're finally um, have in breast cancer. Again, usually we lead the way, but you ovarian cancer uh, people beat us with the, uh, PARP inhibitors. And just to remind us that DNA uh, damage repair pathways are very important in the subtype of triple negative breast cancer. It's essential for cancer prevention. And just a reminder that BRCA functions to repair DNA when it's damaged. And then without the BRCA, cells are prone to being killed by DNA damaging agents, such as platinum. And then these cells have to use alternate ways to repair themselves using an enzyme called PARP. And so that's what the PARP inhibitors do, is don't allow these cells to repair themselves. So um, the landmark trial that led to the first um, breast cancer FDA approval was the Olympiad trial, which was a phase three trial of Olaparib versus chemotherapy for patients that have had prior anthracyclines and or taxanes and have a germline BRCA mutation. And uh, it was uh, Olaparib versus chemotherapy treatment of physician's choice, which included capecitabine, aribulin, or venerelbine. And as you can see here, Olaparib had a superior but modest progression-free survival, seven months versus 4.2 months. And um, <clears throat> it, whether, um, it, and the benefit was most in triple negative breast cancer compared with ER positive. And what was interesting is that uh, this, it was much better tolerated than standard chemotherapy, but the one uh, side effect that was more prevalent in the uh, leper of arm was uh, anemia requiring blood transfusions. So uh, a couple of things that came up are that the elaparib do dose used in this trial was lower than the FDA approved dose. And then did we use a lower bar for efficacy because capecitabine, aribulin, and venerelbine are sometimes used in later lines? However, I think that question is not very valid in a time where we're already using a capecitabine often in those patients that don't achieve a pathologic complete response. We're using carboplatin in our highest uh, uh, risk patients up front. Um, but it was FDA approved earlier this year based on this trial. And then another PARP inhibitor that will probably be approved is based on the Embraca trial, and that drug is called Talazaparib. And you guys are not using that in ovarian cancer from what I understand. And uh, similar to the uh, Olympiad trial, the Talazaparib trial also randomized women to Tala versus physician's choice. And uh, it was a heavily pretreated pa uh, population, including platinum salts, and what they found was that simil very similar to the Olympiad trial, there was a three-month progression-free survival benefit. And um, so now I'm going to shift gears to uh, talking about another drug in breast cancer that will probably uh, be approved within the next year. But I do want to say that um, I think that all of these uh, PARP inhibitor data still underscore something we talked about earlier is that we do need to make sure that these triple negative patients especially have access to genetic testing and proper counseling because we have something actionable in the metastatic setting. So I think, you know, at least in the breast cancer world now, what we're doing in these women is that if they do have metastatic breast cancer, even if they don't have a compelling history, and even if they were diagnosed after 60, which is the NCCN guideline cutoff, uh, we are going ahead and testing them for uh, these mutations to make sure that uh, we don't miss out on the opportunity of using a PARP inhibitor. So I think that is very prop, uh, practice changing. So I am gonna shift gears to a novel agent, Sazituzumab, and I've been practicing this for six months, but I still can't get it right. 
Uh, I like the other uh, name for it, IMMU-132, but this is a very interesting molecule that targets trope 2, an epithelial antigen that's expressed on many solid cancers. And SN38 is the payload, and um, it's more potent than the uh, parent compound, arenotecan. And if we remember, arenotecan causes significant diarrhea, and so this um, is a more targeted agent. And um, the single arm phase two trial uh, showed that patients that um, were receiving this drug in third line or greater had, and they were heavily pretreated with, Im including immunotherapy. And what they found was that um, the response rate was 37%, uh, uh, which is pretty significant in, um, in this heavily pretreated population. So <coughs> the FDA has given it um, um, accelerated um, drug um, prior priority drug review, and there's an ongoing phase three trial right now, the registration trial. Um, and um, if you guys have this trial in the area, uh, please um, think about it. It's called the ASCENT trial, and it's randomizing women to sazituzumab versus capecitabine, or ribulin, gemcitabine, or venerelbine. But in this population that, you know, you've already given the immunotherapy on trial, or, um, and you've given the PARP inhibitor, I think that it's a very reasonable option, rather than giving them gemcitabine or venerelbine. So something to think about. So in conclusion, uh, triple negative breast cancer is a distinct but heterogeneous entity. The role of drugs such as uh, carboplatin are evolving in the curative setting. Capecitabine has compelling survival data in those that don't achieve a pathologic complete response. And then, um, as opposed to a few years ago, we have no novel targets that are promising, including the androgen receptor, immunotherapy, PARP inhibition, and the trope 2. And I want to acknowledge um, some people that sh shared slides and thank all of you. And then, um, you know, I think for the students and residents out there, uh, one big uh, lesson that uh, I would say, that, and Rod would echo this, last year, we spent a year of, uh, it was 15 days for leadership development. And I think one lesson that we all learned is that there were uh, 16 people in that room that had very different personalities, very different strengths and weaknesses. And we, we learned a lot of things of what to do, what not to do. But I think one big thing was that, <laughs> no, no, I, I thought I was. So, uh, and, um, but basically, I think the things that we did learn is that um, relationships are important. And um, I'm grateful to have relationships, you know, um, throughout my career. And um, it was wonderful to be here today. But also, I think that, you know, all of your team sound, seems so outstanding, of physicians that uh, serve our patients. And I think it's amazing. And it reminded us, all of us, of that advocacy is important. Uh, whether it's getting the drugs right, going to Capitol Hill, making sure that we have trials. So thank you, guys.